So thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Lee Hong. I am the uh, director of R&D biomolecules here at Biotage, uh, formerly Finexis. I've been with, the, uh, with Finexis since 2006. So this is essentially my first job. Uh, my colleagues have joined me today as well, Sean. Uh, he is a, a regional marketing manager and then Shadi is here as well. So Shadi, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, I am the application scientist. Uh, I support the East Coast. Uh, so for some of you, that would be me um, helping you to install the system and supporting you. And I am doing a kind of live-ish demo later in the webinar. So if you guys have any questions on that, I'll be able to answer it. Great. So uh, feel free to use the chat function um, to, to ask questions. Uh, Shadi will be able to, to answer them as he goes. Otherwise, he'll interrupt me and then, uh, and then I can answer them as well. Um, and then at the end, we'll open everybody up uh, their, your microphone so, so you, we can have a discussion. Okay, so uh, what do you think, Shadi? Should we just jump right in? Yep. Okay. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now. Great. Okay. Okay, Shadi, can you see the screen? Great. Okay. So uh, this. Uh, thanks for joining the webinar. Thanks again. Um, this is a presentation on our uh, Finexus uh, Five Prep Maxi system. Uh, like I said, uh, Finexus is based in San Jose, and we were acquired by Biotage about two years ago. Biotage is a global company based out of uh, Uppsala in Sweden, and uh, we have uh, research sites in Salem, uh, in Cardiff, in Lund, and we have uh, business sites um, around the world. And so we're happy to be a part of, of Biotage. Biotage are experts in separations, and uh, Finexis is bringing the biomolecule separation to their portfolio. And so um, now we have a, a bigger reach. If you if you know us as, as Finexis, you know what our capabilities of. And now with Biotage, uh, we'll be able to to have even more support. Great. So for this presentation, uh, we're going to talk about. Uh, Kind of the how we see um, the the plasmid DNA purification market um, and, and the need to automate plasmid preps, especially on the larger scale, the maxi prep scale. I'll introduce you to uh, the core of our technology, which we call dual flow chromatography. Then I'll introduce our maxi prep kit, and then followed that uh, with the demonstration by Shadi. So he'll be actually showing the system, uh, how everything runs. Uh, but because of, of COVID right now, we, we decided to uh, do some social distancing and uh, he was able to record this. Um, so we'll be playing that recording for you. Okay. So this is really our, our view of, of where, where things were a few years ago. Um, as Finexis, uh, before we were acquired, we, we had established ourselves as a um, small volume purification company uh, for life sciences. And, and a lot of what we did was purification of antibodies, especially for biopharma companies looking to screen antibodies uh, for leads um, and, and to generate those leads and mature them into uh, potential drugs. And as far as we, we were concerned, antibodies came uh, from hybridomas, uh, taking the mouse, uh, immunizing it, and then sacrificing it uh, to take the spleen cells, to fuse with myeloma cells, to create hybridomas. Um, and then get antibodies, which would then be purified by phytop columns uh, packed with a pro, pro plus resin, protein A resin, protein G resin, et cetera. And as, as we visit our customers and we talked, uh, we would hear conversations in the hallways, you know, people really bummed out about, oh, today I have to rerun uh, eight maxi preps. And so it kind of, you know, these things, we kind of recorded them as, as you know, interesting little tidbits and then our customers started to tell us, you know, actually, uh, you're, you're a little bit wrong. You know, most of our antibodies are not coming from, from hybridomas. You know, we're, we're shifting gears and using transient transfection. And so that, that really got us interested about kind of you know, trying to keep up with, with what uh, pharma is doing, um, trying to, you know, make sure that we're relevant. So we started to study up and we found that transient transfection is, is great because now we have the ability to, uh, or our companies have the ability to do, to do really rational drug design, really do uh, libraries and, and uh, do a lot of mutagenesis to, to create libraries of antibodies that can be screened. 
and, and we found that the advantage of, of transient transfection as, as a way to generate antibodies was with the ability to, to really get uh, you know, full post-translational uh, post modifications. Uh, and we found that people were, were using uh, different cell lines to, to get very high density, um, uh, efficient uh, production of mammalian proteins. Uh, the media that were being used now were, were developed without having to supplement with serum. And, and people were using different, uh, uh, you know, uh, higher quality transient transfection reagents to really increase uh, the ability to get uh, the plasmids into the cells. And, and as we were walking the hallways and we hear people being bummed out about uh, doing maxi preps, you know, we wondered well, what, 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 what the issue is. And what the issue is, is that there's actually a, a high requirement of uh, the amount of plasmid that is needed for a transient transfection. So kind of the way that we see it is in a nutshell, if you have one milligram of plasmid, you can do a one liter expression and you can generate uh, one gram of antibody. And, and that is a pretty large amount of antibody, uh, excuse me, that's a large amount of plasmid than, than what we were used to, you know, coming up, growing up in the molecular biology field. We, we typically just did Kaijin mini preps and, and got a few, you know, uh, micrograms or so. And so this was a scale up and, and there was a, been a lot of, of uh, adoption of, of Kaijin kits uh, for the maxi prep, for example, that were quite labor intensive and manual. And so we decided to look at that and, and think, okay, well, what, what can uh, the, the Finexus technology do? Uh, are there any bottlenecks that we can alleviate here? So we kind of analyzed what, what is it about a maxi prep purification um, that, that is automatable and what, what, it, what are the challenges? And so from a, just a very simplistic view, uh, when we are looking at uh, a Kaijin maxi prep kit, uh, typically, the, the researcher would pellet cells, uh, decant them, resuspend, lyse, and neutralize. Then the sample is cleared. Um, the, the, sample, the clarified, clarified supernatant is applied to a column, and we notice that the column is, is rather high in back pressure. Wash is typically done under vacuum, followed by a gravity elution, and then there was a, typically an ethanol precipitation and a resuspension step at the end. And so if we look at this, automation isn't simply taking a manual method and automating it. Uh, there are key steps that are just not friendly to automation. And so if we wanted to look at this uh, process, if we wanted to develop a kit or a solution that can automate plasma DNA uh, uh, preps at the maxi scale, we're going to have to address uh, three key features that we knew would be a challenge. That is first, uh, clarifying that supernatant because centrifugation and syringe fil filters are just not amenable to automation. Uh, high back pressure columns we know are, are difficult to deal with and um, especially when samples can be variable. Um, the the, the uh, E. coli cultures can be high density, um, they can uh, be overgrown. There, there can be a lot of variability that causes um, uh, variability in, in how the, the, the sample um, uh, interacts with the, the column itself. And finally, with ethanol precipitation, again, centrifugation or syringe filters are just not amenable to automation. So uh, a couple of years later, we came up with this, which is our, our five prep system. And, and this really, uh, we, we got a lot of support um, after the acquisition and, and Biotage really helped us with uh, engineering support and a lot of, a lot of support there. So this system is capable of, of producing uh, one, one milligram of plasmid uh, per sample. Uh, the sample is, is highly supercoiled, uh, which is the, uh, the form of the DNA that is most likely to, to uh, result in a successful transient transfection. Uh, the sample is endotoxin free. And because it's uh, uh, part of a system, we get all the benefits of automation. Okay. So we, we also know that, that researchers are, that their, their time is very important and, and more importantly, manual steps, if we can eliminate them, then that frees uh, the researcher up to do other things. And, and we know that there's a quality of life issue uh, when, when people have to 
uh, do these pr manual preps, especially when you're, you're highly educated and, and can contribute uh, to, to projects and, and you don't need to act just like a pair of hands. And so our big motivation is was to attack the hands-on time of, of a uh, uh, plasmid um, maxi prep. So what we wanted to do was, was just to create something that was very easy to use, uh, kind of a brainless activity, set it up, walk away and do other things. And so what we did was we were uh, used pre-aliquoted buffers. So resuspension, lysis, the precipitation steps uh, are all pre-aliquoted. Um, one would just open the bottle, dump it into the sample and shake it or invert it to mix. Uh, we wanted to use very simple uh, color-coded guides on the on the bottles as well. Um, the deck then would be set up uh, for one, two, three, or four purifications, and uh, we really put a lot of emphasis in it. And Sean really was was the driver for this, um, which was a, a a user interface that was intuitive, easy to use. Um, we we know that researchers. Uh, move around, you know, go from one company to another, and, and we recognize that uh, expertise can be lost. And so we wanted a, a UI that uh, can be picked up by, by new people or, or by, by anybody in the lab without having uh, to lose that, uh, that training. And finally, the sample is collected uh, in a uh, endo, uh, endotoxin-free uh, sterile tube. Okay. And as I mentioned before, our, our motivation was to really minimize hands-on time. And so if we look at a five prep maxi system, uh, if you set up one, two, three, or four samples, it takes about 10 minutes, and then one can walk away and do other things. Whereas with the, the manual kits, it's very obvious that, that you actually have to uh, attend to the columns, um, move buffer around, buffers around, um, measure out volumetrically the different volumes of buffers. Okay, and we needed to do something that was reproducible. So, so we had learned that uh, there were attempts uh, to automate maxi preps in the past by, by other companies, and and there were a lot of attempts at um, at making it a robust system. But but it's inherently a difficult procedure, uh, as I highlighted earlier. Um, one can't just take a um, a, a manual process and automate it. You, you have to really start over and think about it. And so when we were set out to do this, uh, reproducibility was also a major requirement for the system. And we knew that uh, in the end, what was most important is the yield. So a customer needs to get the yield in order to, to get that transient transfection, uh, one liter culture to get that one uh, milligram or one gram of, 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 of uh, antibody at the end. So this is just example data where we purified four samples simultaneously. Um, and uh, our goal is to obtain more than one milligram of yield uh, consistently. Okay. So we'll move on to, to now why it works. And, and uh, we call this dual flow chromatography. So here's a video. So what we're doing is we're actually packing resin. So these are anion exchange resins in a column. Uh, these are packed bed columns and the columns will dip down into the sample and pump that back and forth through. And the idea is that we're really controlling the amount of residence time between uh, the anion exchange resin and the target molecule, which is the, the DNA. I'll just show this a few times. And the idea is that with uh, every increase in the number of passes that we have, the more likely we'll drive that binding to equilibrium. And that's the hallmark of our phytop column, whether it be in the mini, very small scale where we're packing just five microliters of resin, or if it's in this maxi prep scale where we're, we're packing milliliters of resin. Okay. So, now it's possible for the interactions to be complete. And that allows us to really distinguish ourselves from, from other technologies. And so just, uh, just very briefly, uh, we are able to get complete binding. We can get high uh, concentrations of elution uh, by doing this back and forth. We can process different volumes of samples. Um, our columns uh, here, um, not just for the plasmid preps, but for protein purification, we can pack any type of column uh, we can get predictable scale up. And most importantly, this is the format that is most reliable for automation. Uh, we call this the phytop column and it uses dual flow chromatography. 
So if we look at uh, our, our, our manual steps uh, and, and we identify the, the steps that are most difficult to automate with this dual flow chromatography, with the instrument and with the design of our, our column, we've able to eliminate uh, number two as a problem because now uh, we, we don't necessarily need a completely clear supernatant. We can pump back and forth through and, and deal with some particulates. Uh, and I'll show that later. Uh, our columns are low, low back pressure. And so that's why we're able to do that. Uh, we're able to use packed uh, resins with, with uh, large bead diameters and we can uh, decrease back pressure that way. And we're also using wide orifice columns and that, that uh, gives us a higher cross-sectional area, which decreases back pressure as well. And, uh, and so that, that, uh, that also clears out uh, number three. So two and three are, are basically related and solved by the five prep column and the system itself. Okay. So we'll move on now to, to the maxi prep kit. So this is what the kit looks like. This is uh, this is typical of a uh, of a setup where where this is one sample. Uh, we do have several buffers that are shared uh, that uh, are allocated uh, by the customer and, and put into the, the system. So the user would get uh, sample filter boxes, um, five tip columns, and uh, and and tubes, and then also uh, pipette tips. And we have. Uh, bottles here. Uh, each one are pre aliquoted with resuspension buffer, lysis buffer, precipitation buffer. We have elution buffer here, and then uh, RNase as well. So the user would first take RNase, add that to resuspension buffer, and then dump that into the sample containing, uh, uh, which would be a, a pellet of a plasma, uh, a pellet of E. coli. Uh, that's resuspended. Uh, lysis buffer is added to that, and that is uh, inverted. Uh, gently uh, 20 to 30 times. We had, do have a color indicator dye, so which turns blue when everything's fully mixed. And, and we give guidelines to, to, to uh, ask that uh, one not exceed uh, five minutes uh, after the lysis buffer is added. Uh, over lysis will result in a higher number of, uh, higher amount of single strand of plasmid. And, um, and anything that, that uh, reduces the amount of super cold coiled form of the plasmid uh, will result in decreased efficiency in the transient transfection. Next, uh, the precipitation buffer is added. Again, we are very gentle here and we invert that uh, 20 to 30 times. The blue indicator dye would then uh, become neutralized and turn clear. And then that is poured into our sample uh, reservoir here. And there's, there will be a, a uh, filter and so we are able to do a, a partial filtration. Some particulates will go through, uh, but those particulates will then uh, not pose any problem with our column. Once that is complete, then the software is, is, uh, is, is operated. It's very user-friendly, very intuitive. These are just screenshots here, so an introduction uh, uh, page, and then uh, you, one would uh, touch the different buttons. So next, choose maxi prep. Um, one can select one, two, three, or four samples. Um, there are different elution volumes to choose from. Uh, we, we typically recommend using five ml elution volume, which would give us the highest amount of yield. If, uh, if there's a desire to get higher concentrations, we would recommend the three ml elution. Uh, in some cases, um, uh, we have been requested to use 2 ml elution, but we find that uh, there is no real advantage in terms of a higher concentration uh, result with the 2 ml elution. So typically we'll ask uh, to use 5 or 3 ml elution. After that, there are some checks. Uh, we ask the, uh, the user to look at, uh, to pre prepare the sample as I described, to load the deck, um, and then to check the fill levels on the uh, the waste carboys. Once those are checked, the system's ready to go and it will run um, uh, and, and the user is free to walk away and do other other tasks. Okay, so the whole chemistry is actually not that novel. We're, we're just taking the chemistry um, and combining it with uh, a novel form of the, of the um, uh, 
uh, col separation column. So we're doing typical resuspension uh, with uh, EDTA uh, to reduce the activity of the DNA. Uh, RNA is also added to the resuspension buffer, which would remove the RNA from the sample. Lysis is through alkaline lysis with SDS. The SDS will, will actually uh, denature the DNA into single-stranded DNA. That's followed by the precipitation buffer. So other kits call this the neutralization buffer. Once we decrease the pH back down, the single-stranded DNA will renature. It's easier for plasmid DNA to renature into its, its normal form. Larger DNA, such as genomic DNA, will then uh, get uh, caught up in the flocculent and, and precipitate out. Um, this is very typical of, of a, uh, a process uh, for uh, removing genomic DNA from a sample. And, and we are also creating a favorable condition for anion exchange uh, purification. So the, the PKA of the phosphate groups on DNA um, uh, allow us to, to have a, a, a pH where we are uh, in a favorable binding situation. Uh, endotoxin removal buffer is used we are able to consistently achieve less than 0 0.1 endotoxin units per microgram of DNA. So this is all part of the sample prep. Uh, the phytip column is pure, uh, is equilibrated. Uh, this is an anti exchange resin, so we're just getting it ready for binding DNA. Uh, wash is uh, a stringent wash where we're going to remove any small DNAs. Um, it, it'll be stringent enough to remove the endotoxin as well. And then we do uh, elution buffer. And this is actually uh, novel for us. So this is the first anion exchange resin uh, that we were able to screen and find uh, that uses us low salt elution. So we can eliminate the requirement for um, ethanol precipitation and concentration um, after this. Okay. So with anion exchange separation, what's tricky is that um, RNA, DNA, endotoxin basically look the same. They all have these kind of uh, phosphates and w w with negative charges, and th those will bind to the column, uh, which has a positive charge. And so again, what we're doing is we're using RNAs to remove RNA, and we use it, the endotoxin removal buffer to remove endotoxin. So then what's available for binding to the anion exchange resin will be this DNA. And we worked really hard to be able to achieve this, this low endotoxin state. And so uh, uh, zero endotoxin is, is defined as 0 0.1 EU per microgram. And, and that's, that's where we are now. Uh, there are other kits out there um, that are automated um, and, and they are only able to achieve low endotoxin, which is defined as less than 10 EU per microgram. So endotoxin are important for transient transfection because the endotoxins will kill uh, the mammalian cells and reduce the efficiency of the um, production of the uh, of protein. And so uh, in, our, in our guides, in our troubleshooting, if, uh, if you see very high endotoxin numbers, uh, we can kind of look at different, different reasons for that. If one forgets to use the uh, endotoxin removal buffer, but we're at the 50,000 range. Um, old cells, especially cells that have been uh, frozen for a long time, we do see an increase in the amount of endotoxins. If the uh, five prep deck uh, workstation is not kept clean from one uh, use after another, uh, we will see higher endotoxin numbers. And, um, and technique is actually also uh, rather important. Uh, when measuring endotoxin using fresh pipette tips and, and, and just good, good uh, laboratory practice, uh, will actually eliminate some of these uh, uh, falsely high numbers. Okay. So, uh, with, like I said before, uh, consistency was a, is a major uh, advantage of automation. And so here's just example data for consistency. Uh, we get very clean DNA in terms of our A260, A280 ratios, A260, A230 ratios. Um, our plasmid concentrations are about 250 uh, nanogram per microliter range. Uh, we elute in 5 ml. Uh, there is some, some residual fluid that ret is retained on the column. So these are the yields in terms of volumes that we get and uh, the yields in terms of uh, actual amount of plasmid. And again, we're very consistent in, uh, in get achieving that low uh, zero endotoxin number. 
Okay. Uh, we are uh, we do a lot of runs for repetition to get uh, a real accurate number of what to expect, and all of our CV numbers are, are very good, uh, less than less than ten. Um, and this goes for yield, concentration, endotoxin levels, and then also the the cleanliness ratios. And the DNA are actually very high. Uh, super coiled uh, DNA. So uh, what we did was after doing a, a typical prep of four samples, uh, we compare that to a, a Kaijin sample. We, we normalize everything to a certain amount of uh, concentration and we load the same amount. And uh, the majority of the bands here are the super coiled form of the, of the DNA. Okay. Uh, we are able to accommodate a broad range of input as well. We wanted to have some robustness. A lot of labs, uh, our core labs, and, and uh, receive samples uh, throughout the, the organization. And so uh, we wanted to make sure that, that we, we knew how to achieve that one milligram of yield. And so we can give guidelines and say, if, if uh, one can grow cells to five grams of, of pellet wet weight, then, then we are guaranteed to get uh, to that, that one uh, milligram of yield. And so we don't typically like to look at ODs. We feel that there's a lot of uh, dilution factors and, and uh, the, the range of, of the nanodrops and the different spectrophotometers don't give us a good accurate uh, correlation between cell density OD readings and the actual cell pellet wet weight. So when possible, we always ask that, that does the cell pellet wet weight be used as the metric of uh, knowing what is input. So the system can accommodate three, four, five, six, seven grams of pellet wet weight and achieve that one milligram of yield. Uh, so you'll see that as we as we get um, uh, cell cultures that are, if there's too much cell input, uh, the unliced cells actually will decrease the yield. So, so this won't be um, a linear relationship or even plateau, there is, there is a happy medium. So we would say three, four, five, six, or seven grams is, is the perfect uh, window for us. Okay. And finally, uh, I'd like to have a note uh, about the, the salt concentration at the end. So with our system, we're eluding in 50 millimolar tris, pH 8.5, and uh, this is at 500 millimolar sodium chloride. And so if we look at the benchmark Kaijin, uh, that system will elute in uh, 1.25 molar salt. And so because of this situation, uh, the Kaijin kit includes um, uh, the ethanol precipitation at the end. So because we have two, time, two and a half times less salt than Kaijin, we're skipping that altogether and we're still able to get uh, a good transient transfection from that. So this actually streamlines our, our process and eliminates that, that last step that is not friendly to automation, which is the ethanol precipitation part. Okay. And so here are the data to, to show that. Uh, so we compared Kaijin against uh, the maxi prep uh, from our system. And this is uh, before ethanol precipitation, which was just off the column, like I had described. And we also went ahead and split that sample and did ethanol precipitation. Um, and we sent this uh, to Miras Bio to do uh, transient transfections for us. And uh, these are the percentage of positive uh, GFP that we got from our plasmid. And so as you can see, there really is no advantage uh, to doing ethanol precipitation or not. And, and we could compare very well against the gold standard, which is Kaijin. Um, this is using transit uh, transfection reagent. Okay, so um, just a quick note. So for more information, uh, please go to www.finexus.com forward slash five prep or contact our sales department with your questions and learn how to send us your cell pellets for a full remote demo.